If you're in K through fifth grade and you're going next door, you can head out into the lobby. Your teachers will meet you there and get you next door. If you see any kids that were lost in the fog during first service, take them over too. So uh, uh, they're out there. Everybody else, if you want to turn around, say hello to someone around you. Introduce yourself to someone new. I just realized it doesn't do me any good to cough and turn away when there's a microphone on me, so, uh, <clears throat> so sorry for that. Uh, I am that's right. <laughs> I'm getting over a cold, so I sound much worse than I feel, 
And fortunately, I can never feel worse than I look, so uh, that's all, all good. So uh, pardon my voice this morning. Uh, good to have you here today. Uh, if you are new with us and I didn't get a chance to say hi yet, swing by the back of the room when we're done. Uh, I'll be back there. would love to get a chance to say hi or eat lunch with you or whatever the case may be. Uh, speaking of that, after uh, our service this morning, uh, we have lunch provided for you. And then following that, really want to encourage you to stay around. We have what we call our equip times. There'll be stuff for all the kids. But uh, we have our Life Network ministry that we partner with. Uh, They will be here and continuing on. If you don't know, we have uh, one of their Christian uh, pregnancy centers moving into Falcon. And so we're trying to get up to speed on what they will be doing, how to defend the cause of life in our community. And so I really want to encourage you to stick around for lunch today. Stick around for that. It's it's been really, really good. And we'd like you to to be here. I also want to invite you Thursday night from 6 to 6.30. We have a potluck followed by stuff for the kids. And then uh, this time uh, on these Thursday things that we call them, uh, we've been trying to do some roundtables. So we did a political roundtable last week. was a lot of fun. Uh, this week, the staff is going to do a roundtable, and, and the, uh, the topic is going to be, can Christians celebrate Halloween? And so uh, I'm going to be in full costume for that. No, I'm not going to. All right, so uh, we'll be talking about that, and it should be really interesting as we discuss that issue. I also want to let you know, if you have not voted or you do not intend to vote, I want to encourage you strongly. Uh, vote. Uh, make sure you vote this year. Uh, not only uh, with the candidates and all that stuff going on, but if you don't know about uh, Proposal 79 here in Colorado, it would make us the uh, main purveyor of abortion in the world. And uh, as Christians, uh, it is not voting is not necessarily the best or most important way that Christians can make a difference or or bring the kingdom of God to, to earth. Uh, but it is a it is an easy way for us to have influence on our culture, and, and this is a key one. So I want to encourage you if you haven't voted yet to make sure you're voting. Uh, and then on some just some sad news, uh, those of us had gone down to Honduras a couple of weeks ago, uh, worked with a pastor down there. His name was Angel. Uh, he uh, headed up the, the two churches we were working with in the middle of nowhere. Uh, the other day he passed away in a motorcycle accident and uh, left behind two very young kids and a wife and uh, um, very poverty stricken anyway and so I uh, just want you to be praying for those in Honduras for his family uh, the Hondurans especially are really suffering through this uh, next week we will uh, we'll find out what we can do to help the family out we'll probably do uh, we do dollar Sundays every once in a while where we ask you to give an extra dollar over and above what you usually give uh, and, and for a special need and so we'll at least probably be providing that next week so we can help his family and uh, help the churches down there but but be in, be in prayer for that whole thing um, We are continuing on in our study of the book of Romans. And last week, uh, we hit the second part of Romans chapter 1. And uh, how many of you were here last week? Um, It was just bad news the entire time, all right? We got to talk about the happy subject of the wrath of God. There's nothing more fun than the wrath of God. And uh, the Apostle Paul described how we're all under the wrath of God for failing to recognize and obey him. And, and we're going to pay for that. And, and it was just, just depressing. Uh, a famous preacher, his name was Jonathan Edwards. You may have heard about him from uh, uh, many, many, many years ago. He got done preaching that second of, section of Romans. And somebody in the congregation came up to him afterwards and said this, Is there no mercy with God? And Jonathan Edwards' answer was, I'll tell you in a couple weeks. <laughs> that is my way of letting you know. Uh, We're not done talking about the wrath of God yet. We are not uh, done talking about the bad news. Paul knows you have to be very convicted and understand your sin if you're going to be receptive to the good news or if you've already accepted Jesus and have the good news to not take it for granted, to understand how good the good news is. But before we can get there, There's more bad news. So today we pick up Romans chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Therefore, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who do such things. Do you suppose, O man, you who judge those who do such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? So we start out right away with a lot of talk on judgment. And um, this is in context, and you have to understand the context, of what Paul has said leading up to this. That's why he begins us with, therefore. 
He's still building on what he was talking about in chapter 1. We are still in the context of why no one has an excuse for saying they, know, they don't know God or that they don't have a clue that God desires something from them. Paul begins by pointing out that if you judge others, meaning you point out right and wrong for any reason in anybody else, then you will have no excuse when you meet God to say, I didn't know there was a right and a wrong or, or that we're accountable to it. Even those who don't acknowledge there is a God, if they've ever called someone else out for their behavior, they have admitted that they know there's a right and wrong, and they are accountable to it. My grandfather was an atheist. We used to debate this stuff all the time. And I remember a couple times where he would do this whole thing where he would say, well, there is no objective right and wrong. You know, there isn't anything that's really right, inherently right and wrong or that we're going to be held accountable to. And whenever he would do that, I would look for the most valuable thing, usually his wallet, reach over, grab it off the table, and stick it in my pocket. And my grandfather would say something like, put that back. And I would say, why, old man? Is it wrong to take it? You just said there is no right or wrong. There's nothing objective. So I'm bigger and stronger than you are, so I'm taking your wallet. Well, you know that's not what I mean. That's right. Everybody has to admit there's a right or a wrong. Therefore, when God judges us, he's got every right to do it. We know there is a right and wrong, and we've all chosen to do the wrong thing at some point. And we, have, uh, we feel that we have a right to call out others for doing the wrong thing. But then we think God doesn't have the right to call us out. Have you ever heard the old comedian W.C. Fields? You might know the name. He was an old-time comedian. Uh, he was known for living a very immoral lifestyle. And uh, when he was lying on his deathbed, a friend tells a story that he went to visit his friend, W.C. Fields. And when he got there, he was laying in his bed, and he was reading a Bible. And his friend said, I was really surprised he was reading his Bible. I said, well, why are you reading a Bible? And W.C. Fields answered, I'm looking for loopholes. <laughs> That's what Paul's getting at here. We are looking for loopholes to escape the wrath of God. We say, he's not fair, or I have a reason for doing the wrong things that I did, or, or I was ignorant. How was I supposed to know that was wrong? And yet the fact that we judge others and don't accept those excuses from them means we have no excuse when we face God's judgment. We know it's right. We know it's fair. Romans 2, 4. Or, you, or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? He says, be very careful when you think about the idea and you go, well, I'm not paying for it right now. We are not to take God's restraint by not fully unleashing his wrath on us right now. We're not to take that for weakness in God. Don't take his kindness and his patience as a lack of justice. Like he has forgotten what we have done. Realize the fact that God isn't ju judging us now. That he's not pouring out his full wrath on us right now isn't because he's not going to do it. <laughs> it's coming. He is just. He will judge our sin. That warning is echoed by the Apostle Peter. Take a look at 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 9. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some of you count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that anyone should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Often those verses are quoted out of context. Um, and they are made to say that it is some kind of statement on God being outside of time, or God doesn't experience time the same way we do. That is not what's going on in that section of Scripture at all. God is not making some metaphysical comment on the, the nature of time. Peter is warning us of the same thing Paul is warning us of. He says, look, God doesn't have an end, 
He doesn't have a beginning. So whether he is patient with us for a thousand years or just one more day, it's all the same to him. Don't presume that if God is waiting a thousand years to pour out his wrath on our sin, that he's somehow forgotten it. He's just very patient. He's got a lot of time. He doesn't mind waiting. How lucky for us that he is patient with us. He's uh, telling us, don't get complacent. You will be judged, maybe in a thousand years or maybe today. But that patient kindness that God is showing us should drive us to repentance, not complacency. We shouldn't be saying, well, since he hasn't judged us yet, what's the big deal? We should be going, how kind of him not to pay me back yet. I need to repent and get right with him. Romans 2, 5. Romans chapter 2, verse 5. But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He is holding back his wrath. He is giving us time to repent. But it's storing up. <laughs> it is adding up as debt, and it will come due. How many of you have ever just kept putting stuff on a credit card, and eventually you look at it, and you go like, oh, <laughs> that's not good. I didn't know I put that much on that credit card. And now it's due. And I don't have the resources to pay it off. That's kind of like our sin. It is just building up and building up and building up. And God isn't calling it due yet, but he will. The collector's coming. The bill is coming due. Romans 2, 6 through 11. He will render to each one according to his works. To those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jews first and also the Greek. For God shows no partiality. Here's a key fact every human being needs to know. You will be held accountable for your behavior. Let me say this one more time. You will be held accountable for your behavior. Your behavior, good or bad, is the tangible, objective way you show if you acknowledge God or not. For those who have acknowledged him and, and who don't acknowledge him and don't follow him, when your debt comes due, you will face the full wrath and fury and justice of God. But if you've acknowledged God and you've tried to follow him, there will be glory and honor and peace. There will not be judgment. That is the good news, and that's what we're going to talk about in a few weeks. But we're not there yet. We too often reduce our relationship to God to a heart thing. It's a matter of our intentions. As long as I feel love towards God, it's all good. As long as my heart's in the right place, it's all good. But Paul says you'll be judged based on what you've done, not just your intentions. You judge others on what they do, you will face the same thing from God. Now, why this talk of the Jew first and then the Greek? He says that a couple times, so he'll use that idea more later on in the book. In the first century church, there had been some conflict between Christian Jews and non-Jewish Christians. The Jews thought they were more special to God because they were his special people, his chosen people. God had given them directly his word to guard and protect. So they thought that made them special. The non-Jews thought they were special because they saw God is now punishing the Jews for not following his law, and they were now part of the church. They were the new people of God. Paul is saying this, hey, you may see the tangible fury of God on others, 
In this case, he's saying to non-Jews, you have seen the fury of God, the judgment of God on the Jewish people in your past. He's saying you're seeing it in the present. The Romans were persecuting the Jews of that time. And eventually, pretty close to this time, about 70 AD, the, the wrath of God is going to come on the people of Jerusalem. Jerusalem and everybody in it is going to be slaughtered by the Romans. The temple is going to be torn down and destroyed. But he says, Greeks, don't think that means that God won't judge you at some point also. Let it be a warning. His special people didn't escape. What makes you think you will? See, God doesn't show favorites. Everyone will be judged without favoritism, and everyone can be made right with God without favoritism. That's going to be the good news. But we're not there yet. Romans 2.12 for all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. He says, look, Jews and non-Jews, you're both in the same boat. You've just gotten here different ways. The Jews are worthy of God's wrath because they knew God through his law. They have no excuse. And the non-Jews are going to face God's wrath because they knew God through the obviousness of his creation. You both had a chance of knowing God, and neither one of you followed him or acknowledged him. The Jews can't say, well, God gave us the law, therefore we're special and we should get a pass. And the non-Jews can't say, well, we never got the law, so how are we supposed to know we should get a pass? He says, no, you're both going to face the wrath of God. Romans 2.13 for it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. It says for the Jews, it wasn't just a matter of God gave you his law. It was whether you were obedient to it. Did you do the right thing? And every single one of them is going to have to say no. And then he speaks to the non-Jewish people. Romans 2.14 for when Gentiles, the non-Jewish people, who do not have the law, by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. He says, and you non-Jewish people who weren't given the Old Testament law, you still are accountable. You still know there's a right and wrong. Because God has inherently planted something in us that says there is a right and wrong, and you should do the right thing. And if you do, you will be rewarded. And if you don't, you will be punished. And now he explains that further. Look at verses 15 and 16. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or, or even excuse them on that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. Now, I want to take a little detour for a minute, all right? We're going to go off on a little sidebar because I, I want to talk about our conscience. I want to talk about this idea of, of conscience. It literally means a co-knowledge of right and wrong with God, that God knows right and wrong, and so do we. Something has been planted in us that gives us that knowledge of right and wrong. It is inherent in us. It is God-given. It says it is written on your heart. You can't escape it. Um, if you've been to Starting Point, I tell a, uh, a story about they've, they've done experiments on, on babies, psychological experiments. And now one of the things they've done with babies is they've taken little babies right before they're able to speak, but they start to interact. They're starting to understand things. And they would do a puppet show for these little babies. And they'd have two puppets come out, and they'd have a little ball, and they'd kick the ball back and forth. And one of the puppets would have a little piece of candy, and he'd share it with the other puppet. And then they would have a puppet come in. This is the puppeteer I want to be. Then they have a puppeteer come in, and that puppet, when he gets there, kicks the ball away from the other babies. And he takes their candy, and he doesn't share with them. And with no words being spoken, what do you think very quickly the babies in the audience start doing? They start crying. They get very agitated anytime that puppet shows up. Why? They can't even talk. We can't teach them anything yet. And what are they recognizing? That's a bad puppet. <laughs> and those are good puppets. How do they know? God has written it on our hearts to know there are some things that are right, 
there are some things that are wrong. But our conscience isn't the ultimate judge of right and wrong. It just points us in a general direction to say there is a right and a wrong and we should do the right thing, but it doesn't give us really details on that. So if anybody has ever given you this advice, follow your heart, don't take any more adv advice from them, all right? That is horrible, horrible advice. Follow your sense of right and wrong, your feeling of right and wrong. The Bible says our conscience can be in different working conditions. It doesn't always work correctly. So let me walk you through what the Bible says the condition of our conscience can be. Ideally, the Bible says you want your conscience to be good. 1 Timothy 1.5, the aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. 1 Peter 3.16, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. Acts 23, 1, and looking intently at the council, Paul said, brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day. When the Bible talks about having a good conscience, it means it's intrinsically good. It, 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 at the very heart of it, it's good. It is noble. It is beneficial. It is actively virtuous. It's aligned correctly with God's knowledge and God's right and wrong. This is the type of conscience that God wants us uh, to develop, one that matches how he sees right and wrong. The Bible then says you can have a clear conscience. Hebrews 13, 18. Pray for us, for we are sure that we have a clear conscience, desiring to act honorably in all things. Acts 24, 16. So I always take pains to have a clear conscience towards both God and man. 1 Timothy 3, 9. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. So we get this idea of a good conscience, and then we get this idea of a clear conscience. This means that you are free from feelings of guilt. Uh, correctly free, because we're going to see in a moment, being free from guilt doesn't always mean your conscience is working right. But if you have a good conscience, you will not feel guilt for the wrong things, and you will feel guilt for the right things, all right? It will be clear. You won't have any problems understanding, okay, that's something I should do, and that's something I shouldn't do. You won't feel guilty for the right things. You'll feel guilty for the wrong things. Then the Bible says you can have a purified conscience. Hebrews 9, 14. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? This is the idea of God is what tunes our conscience, makes it right. He purifies it. He aligns it with himself. It becomes steady. It becomes uncontaminated. This is the state God wants it to be where he is in control of your conscience. Now, let's talk about how our consciences can be twisted. We first get the idea of our conscience can be weak. We can have a weak conscience. 1 Corinthians 8, 7. However, not all possess this knowledge, but some, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Uh, the idea of a weak conscience is it lacks any moral strength. It doesn't translate into right behavior. It is vulnerable to corruption. It is easily misled by other people telling you things, and your conscience isn't strong enough to know what's right or wrong. Then we sink down another level and we're told you can have a defiled conscience. Titus 1.15. To the pure, all things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their minds and their consciences are defiled. This is the opposite of purified. Our conscience becomes contaminated. It becomes polluted. Uh, it is in a persistent state of misalignment with right and wrong as God defines it. Then we go down another level, and it says, then your conscience can become seared. 1 Timothy 4.2. Through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. This is where it gets really dangerous, because we find out that our, our conscience, our heart, can be rendered insensitive. 
It can become scarred. It's no longer active. It doesn't give you any input. It doesn't tell you things are right. It doesn't tell you things are wrong. Nothing bothers you anymore. That's why follow your heart <laughs> doesn't work. Why? Because if my heart is infected by sin, my conscience gets all messed up. And it's really interesting in our culture, as our hearts get more and more infected by sin, guess what advice we're given more and more? Follow your heart. Yeah, but the problem is our heart's corrupted. Yeah, you should follow it more. I mean, that's straight from Satan. And then the most dangerous level is the Bible says our, heart, our conscience can actually become evil. Hebrews 10.22 let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Get this. Your conscience can become actively opposed to right and wrong, to God's right and wrong. We can become aligned with evil. Not just insensitive where we don't notice anymore or lacking a strength, but our conscience can be aligned with evil. We start rejoicing in the bad and hating the good. Your conscience starts giving you the opposite of what's true. Thinking evil is good, thinking good is evil. Anyone seeing that happen in our culture right now? As we sink further and further into sin, eventually everything gets flipped. Now... Here's the thing. Don't fall for the old Disney line from Jiminy Cricket, let your conscience be your guide. All right? It is not to be your main guide. Your conscience lets you know there is a right and there is a wrong, but it is only accurate if it is guided by God's word and God's spirit. You have to give him control of it so that it starts lining up with his objective truth. Now, once again, the whole point about talking about our conscience here is to make it clear that rather you had the Old Testament law directly from God or you just have your conscience, you'll have no excuse in escaping God's judgment and wrath. Everybody knows there is a right and wrong. We might get it messed up at times because we get involved in sin, but even the person who, who their conscience is now evil will say, there's a right and there's a wrong. They just get it messed up. You want to say right and wrong is determined by society or it's determined by evolution? Fine. That still means you know there's a right and a wrong. And that means you'll have no excuse when you face God's judgment for your behavior. Paul wraps up this section in verses 17 through 24. I'm not going to read it all for you. But he turns to the idea of hypocrisy then. And he starts listing the ways that we accuse others of doing the wrong thing. But then we do the same thing. His point isn't that we shouldn't point out sin. We get told in the Bible all the time that we are to point out sin. But his point is we are not to think that by pointing out others' sins, you're off the hook. Or you're special. Or you're without sin. Or you're not going to have to pay. There are two reasons people give to say why they're going to heaven. The first one is, they'll say it's karma. They'll say, I'm 51% good, 49% bad. Therefore, I'm a good person, I get to go to heaven. That's like thinking a bottle of water that is just 49% filled with poison can be marked pure. You go, that, no, no, no. How much poison is needed to go in that bottle to make it no longer pure? Any amount of poison makes it poisonous. It's not how much, it's any poison will ruin it. And any sin you have committed makes you sinful. Not about how much, it's any. How damaging is it? Poison's poison, a drop makes it unpure. Sin is sin. One of it makes you sinful. And any sin, Paul says, will be met with the fury and the wrath of God. The second reason people give that they think they're going to heaven is that they'll say, well, I'm better than, look at the person next to you. All right, go ahead, yeah. You know, there's somebody sitting there, and you're going like, oh, yeah, I mean, I'm better than that, all right? And if you looked around and went, oh, no, they're all better than me, you can always put Hitler out there, all right? You can always go, look, I'm better than Hitler, 
And Hitler's the one that's going to go to hell, not me. He's the one going to face the wrath of God. I'm not going to get the same thing he's going to get. There's no way. I'm better than he is. That's the heart of hypocrisy. It's judging myself by others instead of judging myself by the purity and goodness of God. He says, you don't get to judge yourself by everybody else who's in the same boat. I'm the measure. Don't be a hypocrite thinking you have to be better than them. You don't have to be better than them. You got to be better than me. Good luck with that. Hypocrisy is one of the biggest criticisms about Christians. Why don't you go to church? Because they're all hypocrites. Yeah, and that leads people to say this. Look at Romans 2, verse 24. For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Blaspheming at its, at its basic uh, definition is just you attribute evil to God. That's kind of a, a basic definition of blasphemy. And so what it's saying is, as Christians, when we are hypocritical, when we say, well, they're all bad, but I'm not, it causes outsiders to go, well, God must not be good. So that's a problem. That's understandable. I mean, we don't like hypocrites. But here's the problem. We're all hypocrites. And I love this phrase. Somebody said, if you find a perfect church, don't join it. You'll ruin it. Yeah. We're all hypocrites. My Detroit Tigers made the playoffs this year. It was fantastic. They made the playoffs. In the beginning of July, baseball is all about statistics. Beginning of July, they had a 0.2% chance of making the playoffs. And my whole family was going, why are you still watching them? There's no hope. The season's over. And I said, they're going to make the playoffs. I know it. They're just, I just believe they're going to make the playoffs. I'm cheering them on. And, and they start winning. And in the last week of the season, they're at like 78% chance of making the playoffs. They have to win two games out of like five in this last week. And as I'm watching that last week of baseball, the entire year, they'd had about 15,000 people showing up for the games. You know how many showed up the last week each game? 45,000 people. And I went, what a bunch of hypocrites, and I stopped watching the games. I ain't hanging out with those hypocrites. I'm not going to be a fan of the Tigers. Look at all the hypocrites that are showing up. Do you think that's what I did? I went, good to have you on board. <laughs> I, I didn't go, I'm throwing out the team because there's hypocrites involved. No. And yet we try to do that with God. I'm going to throw out God because some of his fans are hypocrites. It's not about his fans. It's about him. See, what we really don't like is blatantly hypocritical people. That's who Paul just got done describing. He said, it can get so big that you guys give God a bad reputation. You give non-Christians an excuse. Look at Romans 2.22. Here's one of the things that Paul said during his, where he's listing all of our hypocrisy. He says, you who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? It says it's that blatant hypocrisy. You tell them it's wrong and you're doing the exact same thing. So how do we avoid blatant hypocrisy as Christians? How can I not be a hypocrite and still deal with and talk to people about sin? You're right, this is a really complicated answer. Here's the, here's the complicated answer. Admit I'm a hypocrite. Have you ever been here when behind me on the screen I've had a hypocrite alert? I'll do those every once in a while. That's basically to protect myself because I know I'm about to say something that when I get home, my wife's going to go, you don't do that. <laughs> and I'm going to have to go, uh, yeah, I got to work on that. Or my kids are going to go, you just told parents to do this and you didn't do that. Yep, that's right. I mean, when I know and I'm going, oh, this is going to be bad. I'm going to have to talk about something that I, I, I mess up in my own life a lot. I put a hypocrite alert up behind me. See, we need to admit we're sinners. Even if we commit different sins than everybody else, we seek to do the right thing, but we also admit when we mess up. Don't claim more righteousness than you possess. Paul's going to say this later in Romans. He's going to come back to this. Here's what he says later on. This is Romans 12.3. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, do not think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. See, we're supposed to say, yeah, I'm a hypocrite. 
I mean, it doesn't make sin invalid. It doesn't mean that others aren't going to face the wrath of God. It just means I am too. <laughs> We're all in the same boat. We don't do this perfectly. And on the other hand, we also can't think if we simply admit that we're sinners that God's going to give us a pass. Well, God, I admit it, I'm a sinner. I mean, I'm humble about it. I put it up front, so I'm off the hook. I don't have to face your wrath, right? We have been given standards by God, and there are consequences to our sin. And different sins have different consequences. Uh, last week, we talked a little bit about excommunication in the church. When someone claims to be a Christian but exhibits extreme hypocrisy, they flaunt their sin. They refuse to repent when it's called out in them. There are to be strong, clear consequences for that type of in-your-face sin in the church. But we also find other sins carry lesser consequence. So we get instructions in the Bible that if certain men want to have responsibility for the spiritual guidance of a church, we call them shepherds here, but they're called overseers, elders. If they want to have that responsibility, then, then there's certain sins that will disqualify from that, them from that, that they need to make sure they aren't committing. 1 Timothy 2, 3, 2 and 3 gives us some of these sayings. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. It says there's some consequences for those sins too. There might be some responsibilities that you can't have, certain things God can't do with you. Here's the big idea. As Christians... We are never to think we aren't in the same boat as everyone else when it comes to sin in general. We don't have an excuse to justify ourselves before God just because we can show someone else is committing sins that we don't, as if we don't sin. We have no excuse in dodging God's wrath. That's the end of my message this morning. Um, sorry, uh, that's where we end. Um, it's another week and we still don't have a way to escape God's wrath. Well, actually, we just got buried more in it. We we're going, oh man, I thought at least I could hold up somebody else and go, they're worse than me. Or I could point out somebody else's sin. Maybe that'll get me out of this. Nope, we're stuck. We are buried in sin. We are saturated in it. And there's nothing we can do to get out of it. Hopefully, that bad news humbles you. Hopefully, that leaves you on your knees. It does me. Hopefully, it draws us to repentance. God, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Because if it does that, we are closer to being ready for the good news. Hang on. The good news is coming, and I will promise you it's very, 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 very good news. But it's not coming next week. So let's pray. <laughs> Lord, I, I want to thank you for something kind of strange. I want, to, I want to thank you for your wrath at sin, for your sense of justice, that you will set things right that that sin in our lives that destroys us and destroys others, has destroyed your creation, has ruined our reputation with you, that that makes you angry. That it won't go without payment. That things will be set right. But I want to thank you for your patience, that you have not poured your wrath out on us right now. I want to thank you for your kindness that provides a way for us to escape that wrath. And that's through Jesus. And that's the good news. What we can't do, you are willing to do for us. You will pour your wrath out on your own son so that we don't have to face it. I pray that we will be people who understand how deadly and damaging sin is. I pray that we will not follow our hearts or let our conscience be our guide, but that we will follow you and your ways. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. I pray that you make us people of obedience. We know we won't be perfect, 
We know that we are due wrath, but we thank you for your mercy and your kindness through Jesus that allows us to be forgiven and made right with you, that you will pay the debt we can't pay. And so we come before you humbled and repentant, and we thank you for all that you've done through Jesus. And it's his name we pray. Amen.
God, thank you for the light. Isaiah 60, verse 20. Your sun will never set again, and your moon will wane no more. The Lord will be your everlasting light, and your days of sorrow will end. When we are in the darkness, or our view of you is cloudy, your light never fades from view. God, you are a beacon of hope, a lighthouse for the lost, and a fire for the weary. Even though we have done nothing to deserve it, you give it willingly. Now is our time for communion. As God has willingly given us his light, he has willingly given his one and only son to die on the cross for our sins. There are tables at the front, back, and sides of the room. Please come forward when you're ready.
top of our lungs You are God and we will not be shaken Unafraid, unashamed, Lord, we know who we are We are your people and we won't be silent Unified, hear us cry at the top of our lungs to meet you. My name is Monica Livingston, and I'm the relationship care pastor here for the Core Christian Community and for Meridian Point. And I have a couple of announcements. First, I want to invite you out um, to come out on Thursday nights. We have been having so much fun on Thursday nights, having a round table. This last time we had the Geithners out here and we did talked about political stuff and kind of all of that and how that runs. And I I got so much good information about how we can get more knowledgeable. Um, I know Lakeisha was listening to a podcast that was mentioned during that Thursday night that she's already enjoying and was saying how much she had already learned about some of the things that were on the ballot. And so see uh, Barry or Carrie Geithner or any of them that will tell you about that podcast. If you're kind of just wondering, hey, what's on the ballot? What does the, what do, can we learn if we don't know what's going on? There's lots of things that are coming up that I think for us um, as believers, believers we should know more about. So um, we will be here this Thursday and we will have another round table time. We have a potluck from 6 to 6.30 and then we come in here. Well, actually we're already in here, but and then we we uh, have a discussion from 6.30 um, to 7.30. There's a uh, kids program next door for your uh, K through 5th and they are uh, welcome to go over there and um, be over there having fun and learning stuff as well. So really encourage you to to come out and do that. Also wanted to let you know that next Sunday is our fill a truck for Life Network. And so they will bring a truck. I Did he say, what is the name Bill or something? The truck has a name. It's is, oh, it's Phil. Oh, it's Phil. Oh, fill the truck. Ah, fill the truck. Okay, fill the truck will be here next Sunday. And so bring all, I see a lot of you who's also the light bulb just went on. Um, and we want to just be able to help them get a start. The, the, the store is opening up down there. And we want to just be able to provide not only our community, but Life Network with the ability to do all the things that they're doing. So if you have been saving up your stuff and you were going to drop it off somewhere else, bring it. Also, Monica at My Core Community, if for some reason you know that you're not going to be here on Sunday, Send me a message. I am going to do, I have a couple of um, times where I'm going to meet people down here at the building to just bring stuff. And so if you need that, go ahead and email me. We will try to get the, the building open so that you could drop that off as well. This is your first time with, you, with us. We do something called Connect and Equip, and that's what we're getting ready to move into now. And what that is, is it's us opening up the kitchen and serving you lunch free of charge. Um, and so today we are having Little Caesars Pizza, which makes a lot of kids very, very happy. Um, and me too. And so then we will have salad up, up here and drinks in the back. But this is a time for you to kind of get to know those that are involved in the core uh, and that you can meet someone. We know relationships are super duper important. And so if you are able to and you uh, weren't planning on staying, stick around. You have to eat lunch anyway. 
At 1 o'clock, we have been having Alan come out from Life Network, and he has been talking to us about how do we go out and tell our community um, about what they're doing out here? How can we stand up for life? How can we do that? We've got Fox, who has been in the schools doing some actual teaching. They have a program where we are able to do that. We are really, really excited that we are getting to um, come alongside them and help them in this ministry that we believe so fervently in. And so um, Alan is here, and he has been doing a super job. We have two more weeks of that. And even if you haven't come, the last two weeks still come. Each week is new information, and I think you will enjoy it very, very much. And so we're going to um, stand up. I'm going to close this out in prayer. And we're going to stack the chairs in the rows that we're in, nine high. And then someone will bring in tables, and we're going to put those up. As soon as I get back to the kitchen, we are going to be ready to serve. I'm going to put it up, and we can get your pizza to you. So don't leave. Stick around um, and let us uh, just hang out for a little while. So if you want to stand, I'll close us in prayer and we will get started. Father God, I thank you so much for who you are, Lord. I thank you um, just the way that you meet us and love on us and take care of us. And Father, I just, I know that there's those in the room that are just have burdens right now, Lord God. And I just pray that they can feel your presence just so clear and hear your voice and in the direction that they should be going in their lives, Lord God. I thank you for this time that we're getting ready to enter into. Um, just like in Acts, they were meeting together um, every day and they were breaking bread and they were eating together. Father, so I just pray that um, those that are here will just stick around and have lunch um, and get to know others in, in the church, Lord God. Um, Father, and then um, at one Lord, where we're being equipped so that we can leave this building and go out and talk about the things that we believe and be able to do that with those that may not believe the way um, we believe or maybe they're just not sure about uh, uh, what they believe and that we can help them along the way, Lord God. Um, so I thank you for a church that does that. Father, we love you and we thank you for all that you do for us. And it's in Jesus' precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. All right, let's be the church.